erste Form Existenz, jedem gesuchten Volk. Hitler, der ist äh, historische Völker wie England und Französisch, die kleinsten Nationen, es haben die kleinsten Verdiensten wie die Alpanien, die Syrien, sie haben eine Unterschaftung in Existenz, es ist ein nationaler Staat und die ganze Welt. And welcome to Americans for a Safe Israel's annual Zev Jabotinsky Memorial. Tonight, as we remember and give tribute to the man who inspired our formation, we reaffirm our guiding principle, Jabotinsky's Iron Wall. The Iron Wall against those who want to destroy our souls. The Iron Wall signifies an impenetrable strength on the part of the Jewish people who came to reclaim their homeland. Strength of will and strength of might. Only this would compel the Arabs to come to an arrangement with Zionism once and for all. In Jabotinsky's words, the mistake of many Jews is that they shut their eyes to one of the most elementary rules of life, that you must not meet halfway those who do not want to meet you. The Iron Wall signifies the might of the Jewish people living in their 3,000-year-old homeland. And as history has shown, since the ingathering began, this strength is solid. So just last week, Israel's foreign minister, Yisrael Katz, speaking to the press, put it this way. There's nothing more expressive of our return to Zion and the success of Zionism than the strengthening of the sovereignty of Israel and the Jewish people in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was and always will be the beating heart of the nation. Once that is established, the rest of our history is cemented. Jerusalem, Zion, the eternal capital of the people of Israel, was just, in December of 2017, recognized by the United States, home to most of us here tonight, as the capital of the Jewish state. And this past May, wasting absolutely no time, the US Embassy was moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. We have a lot of things to feel good about. In 2015, AFSI fought hard to prevent the signing of the treacherous Iran deal. And in May of last year, the US withdrew from this outrageous deal. The Golan Heights, annexed by Israel in the early 80s, was officially, in March, acknowledged by the US as a part of Israel. The U.S. saw the strategic significance, significance of the Golan Heights in keeping Israel and the region safe. The U.S. has defunded UNRWA, pulled out of the Israel-bashing UN's Human Rights Commission, in every way has shown its commitment to the realities of the region. This all stems from a place of truth. The truth makes us strong, just like Jabotinsky's Iron Wall. The American government has certainly reached a pinnacle in its relationship with Israel. American Jews, on the other hand, appear to be going the other way. The trend is to care less, and identify less. 
It's to right offset this trend and make a difference for our youth that we at AFSI have initiated a new program in Israel that has met with unprecedented success. This past academic year, AFSI was able to bring over 1,000 Jewish youngsters on gap year and study abroad programs in Israel on free day trips to Judea and Samaria. Without a doubt, these young people would never have, ve have ventured over the Green Line. They never would have seen with their own eyes the beauty of our ancient biblical heartland. And they would not have been prepared at all when they returned to their US college campuses to fend off the accusations of the haters that unfortunately most will face. It's our fervent hope that these thousand students will disperse in the US and they will now be able to stand with and lead and strengthen pro-Israel groups on the many and varied campuses they will head to this fall. Ideally, we'd like to grow the program next year. More students armed with more advocacy training, it would be great. And we plan to do it. And now I have the honor of introducing a man who has devoted his life to Jerusalem, to keeping it the undivided capital of the Jewish nation. He puts his heart and soul and whole being into his work and his place on Jerusalem City Council. I am honored to introduce to you Arye King. Good evening. We are now in the middle of the nine days. The nine days when we must, during these days, remember, think, and mourn for the situation that we are still missing something in Jerusalem. This is the temple. So when we say, the Shana Abba Yerushalayim Abnuya, this is because we are still missing something in Yerushalayim. In the Gemara, in Yerushalmi, it's written that every generation, every generation, that in his time, the temple will not be built, is responsible exactly like the generation when the second temple was destroyed. It, the, this generation that during his time, the temple will not, will not be built, is responsible exactly like the generation then, thousands of years ago, responsible that, to the situation that the temple was destroyed. To remi remind you, the temple was destroyed because of Sinat Chinam. Because we didn't know how to respect each other. And I think that we, with all of what we are doing day to day, thinking about uh, many things that are important for us, Eretz Israel, Yerushalayim, fighting here, fighting there, we should all the time think about how we do it by respecting each other. And by that, maybe we will see, without Hashem, in our days, real Yerushalayim Abnuya with a tem temple at the, Mount of te at the Temple Mount. And now I will go to a few facts that I hope will shake you a bit so you will understand that you need each one of you here to leave this, uh, this event this evening with knowing that you need to do, to do a bit more for Yerushalayim. Because Yerushalayim, it's not belong to the people living in Yerushalayim and not for the people working in Yerushalayim Yerushalayim belongs to all of us. If I would now ask somebody here that I don't know, if I would ask you, describe yourself, you would say, maybe you would say, I am American. 
then I am, maybe I am a Jew. And then I will ask you more. I'm sure some of you, if not most of you, will say, I am Zionist. Correct? So why are we calling ourselves Zionist and not Yerushalayimist? Or Israelist? What is Zionist? No, Zion is not Yerushalayim. And the proof that Zion is not Yerushalayim is the Tikva that we just now sang. How we are finishing the Tikva? Eretz, Zion, Ve, Yerushalayim. Because it's not the same place. When you go and mourn somebody in Shiva and you leave his house, what do you say? I'm coming to you in Shara, Ve, Zion, Ve, Yerushalayim. When you are at the wedding at the chupa and then the sheva brachot, there are two blesses, ble, uh, brachot that you say. One is, sof tasif et agel ha'akara b'kibbutz b'nei ha'tochah b'nyanah, b'ruch ata Hashem, m'sameach, ציון בבניה. And the last bracha is, עוד יישמע בערי יהודה ובחוצות ירושלים. Why do we have two blessings all the time? Also the same in ברכת המזון. You see, all the time, ירושלים and ציון, it's not the same place. Why it's so important? Because Zion, if you take the dot above the vav in Zion and you put it in the middle, you will have another word, Zion, the remark place, the place of the temple. When you call yourself Zionist, it means that you are a temple activist. And I'm happy with that. You are not Yerushalayimist, you are not Israelist. Because all the purpose of making Aliyah all the purpose of making Aliyah la Rege to Yerushalayim, it's not to go to Yerushalayim. It's to go to the temple. And we must understand that. Why? Because this special place, small and significant place for our nation, the Temple Mount, this is, a, I would say, the microcosmos of what's happening in all of Yerushalayim and all of Eretz Israel. If we want now to go tomorrow to the Temple Mount and we will be catched with a Siddur or God forbid with a Tanakh, we will be thrown out and take to the police station. But if we will go with a smartphone where we have everything inside, including the Gemara, Babli, Yerushalmi, Mishneh, Kabbalah, Zohar, this is okay. You can go out onto the Temple Mount with a smartphone. You have everything in the smartphone. But a book, no, because it's a symbol. With Israeli flag, you will be arrested because it's a provocation to go with Israeli flag to the remark place, the area, the place that because of that we call ourselves Zionist. And if this is a situation that at this place, we are not able to behave like the owner of this place. We understand that we are in a big, big problem. And it's not just in this place. 14 years ago, 14 or 15 years ago, the disengagement of Gush Katif and Gaza Strip started, uh, sorry, finished. Finished by Arik Sharon, the prime minister that closed and locked the gate and transferred and threw the Jews out. But Arik Sharon is, what, is not the one to be blamed. He is the last person to do what people started before, much before of him. It started in 1994 when Israel decided to, de to redraw from central of towns in Gaza Strip. And it continued later when Israel decided from security reason only, only, to put a fence around Gaza Strip. And then later, from security reason only, we put checkpoints in the entrance to the Gaza Strip. And then, from security reason only, if you wanted to go to visit your friends, in Etzarim, for example, you had to go with a convoy, bulletproof, with police in front, army, everything, everything from security reasons. And we know how it's ended. Not security, I'm not even close to it. It was a politi political step that were done year 
after year after year, and they ended when Prime Minister Arik Sharon locked the gate and threw out the Jews from their houses, synagogues, and cemeteries. My dear friends, we all were quiet and silent when it happened since 94. We waked up just when Sharon did the last, the last move. And I'm here to tell you, unfortunately, that it's happening today in Yerushalayim. Yes. The same security reasons. You know, FC group, some of you, and I'm calling to all of you here that were not in the past in FC uh, 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 trips to Eretz Israel and to Yerushalayim, one or two of the groups that came with me, I took them to see one of the embarrassing, embarrassing things that you can face as a Jew in Yerushalayim. We came with a bus. We wanted to enter to a neighborhood in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. And a big sign welcomed us. No entrance to Israelis in Yerushalayim. So first of all, when you next time you hear about from the BDS people, all of these good guys, that there is apartheid in Yerushalayim, you should say they are right. There is apartheid. We are secondary citizens and residents in Yerushalayim, and I'm telling you that as a city councillor of the city of Yerushalayim. We don't have the same rights like Arabs have in Yerushalayim. It's fact. It's fact. So they put a big board in the entrance to eight neighborhoods. Eight neighborhoods in Yerushalayim Jews are not allowed to enter to. Judenrein in the capital of the Juden nation. Did you hear any politician talking about it? No. Danny Danon, I took him to see it. I told him, talk about it. Sipi Chotoveli, I took her to see it. Nothing. Exactly the same silence that we heard. Silence that we heard from politicians before the disengagement from Gaza Strip and north of Samaria. We heard them after they voted and supported it in the Knesset, like Bibi Netanyahu, of course, that supported the disengagement. And after that, he said, ooh, it was a mistake. Like he did in Hebron like he did in Abu Dis. Facts. Don't listen to politicians. I am politician, small one in Jerusalem. Don't listen to us. Check us by what we are doing. And if we check, if you check the right-wing government, you check. Bibi came to here, to New York, few, two years ago, was so proud to say he's a prime minister that built, built less than all the prime, prime ministers before of him in Judea and Samaria. He was so proud. He, he, he waved in the Jewish Congress here, saying that. I built less than any prime minister. What's so proud of it? In Jerusalem, if you, your name is Arye and you own the land in the, in the neighborhood called Shimon HaTzadik, and next to you there is an Arab on the same land, the same size, you will ask for a building permit to get at the same time like him. He will get the permit after six to eight months, you after eight or nine years. Why? Because you are a Jew. I can give you plot numbers, block numbers, street address, everything. Check me. Ask Pinsky family from Woodmere that own land in Shimon HaTzadik. Nine years are waiting to build, but because they are Pinsky, they cannot build. But their neighbor already went into the new building. Ask the Moscovich family from Florida, Miami. Because they are Moscovich and not Abdallah, so they are not allowed to build. Including this in these years, it's not a Rabin, Perez. So we have eight neighborhoods we are not allowed to enter to. In the temple, we are, we are visitors. 
We have two hours in the morning, two hours in the middle of the day, and that's it. Today, even if you get close to the gates, to the temple, and you are being catched with a flag, not in, next, outside, but next to the gate, to the police station. We cannot build because we are Jews. We don't have freedom of movement. I was born in a kibbutz, Kibbutz Alumim. Kibbutz Alumim is one and a half kilometers from Gaza. One and a half kilometers from Gaza. With, when I was young, when I was in 15, 14, 16 years old, I could go and swim in the beaches of Gaza. I could take my bicycle and visit my sister in a Tsarim settlement. I can go and eat shaykh. Eat shaykh in the middle of Gaza and go to Ashkelon or go to Gush Katif. It's not that I was a superman. No, everybody did it. Even my sister did it. Everybody was in the middle of Gaza. It was obvious. The same obvious like my children today m walking from Mount of Olives to Bnei Akiva in the old city. It's still obvious that they can do it. But I'm not sure it's going to be forever. Because the same thing that we saw in Gaza, we are seeing today in Yerushalayim. When you have a minister of Yerushalayim from the right-wing party Likud, of course, yeah, talking about a great idea. Let's take neighborhoods out of, out of Yerushalayim. In this way, we get rid of Arabs, and then we have less Arabs in Yerushalayim. What a great solution. Let's take all the Jews to America, and it's also nice, no? No Arabs, no problem with demographics, problem issues. So a minister from the Likud party Minister of Yerushalayim. He comes with an idea, let's take eight, sorry, nine neighborhoods out of Yerushalayim. And everybody, shh, silence. Nobody's arguing with him. So I'm here to tell you that if you will continue, be silence. And if you continue meeting politicians and not ask the right question, don't be surprised, surprised. Exactly like from 1994 to 2004, and when B Sharon said that, and five, he implemented it, 10, 11 years, finito. No Gaza Strip, no north of Samaria. 11 years. So the 11 years of Jerusalem started already. And we are silent. And I'm here to tell you, it's not my problem, yes. My house was attacked this Sunday when I was in Montreal. <coughs> Molotov cocktails. At May 2019, this year, we stopped counting the Molotov cocktails. After we counted already 200 Molotov cocktails on my house, and not one Arab was arrested. You can guess what will happen if two Molotov cocktails, four, five, would thrown about on the house of Bibi Netanyahu. But it's Arya King and his neighbors, 200. Yeah. Fireworks, shooting, uh, nobody was arrested. This year, this, the, uh, sorry, this time, sorry, by the way, at Sunday, first time they arrested somebody. The guys that throw the Molotov cocktails. And the, the, the distance from the kibbutz alumim or other kibbutzim around Gaza to Gaza, it's one kilometer, two kilometers, three kilometers, but just you need to understand. These nine neighborhoods that the minister Zev Elkin suggested and still suggesting to take out of Yerushalayim, it's not one and a half kilometers, it's not even half a kilometer. You know what the distance between the Jewish neighborhood and the Arab neighborhood that he's talking about? Six meters. Six meters between Neve Yaakov to the neighborhood of Aram that he wants to take out. You don't need to dig tunnels and to send missiles. You can have a terrorist sit on your balcony or if you want even in your saloon and shoot into the Jewish guy's uh, houses. So friends, I'm telling you, Yerushalayim 
is under a great, great, big threat and risk that the, that, that, that the, op, the, 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 the point that my children today can walk to the old city, today it's still happening. And you can come to the Kotel, you can still, and you can go to the old city and to the city of David, but you know what? I also went to, the, to my sister in Netzarim. We could go to the hotel in Gush Katif. Everything was fine until we waked up. Everything was prepared. Slowly, slowly. So we are very close to the Tisha B'Av. And I'm really hoping that this situation and facts, and again, it's facts. Don't listen to what they are talking all the time. United Jerusalem, Jewish Yerushalayim. We call it it's shtuyot. Words are like that. Fact on the ground, Bibi is freezing Jerusalem for the last 10 years. 10 years. You know what happened because of this freeze? Just to understand the numbers. At 2008, there were 68% of the population of Jerusalem Jews. 68. Today, some people will say 62. Some will say 60. If Bibi and people like him continue deal, dealing with Jerusalem in the same way, in 18, 17 years, we are 50, 50. Not because we don't want to live in Jerusalem. Because it's so expensive. We are not building in Jerusalem. And on the other hand, the Arabs are building as much as they want, legal and illegal. And Bibi is not allowing us, the municipality, to destroy the illegal buildings. So you can buy in East Jerusalem in like 40% cheaper than what in west of Jerusalem. So today Arabs are coming are immigrating to Jerusalem because it's so cheap. And Jews, are running, they cannot afford it. So they, you, you move to Bet Shemesh, to Pizgat Zeev, Gush Etzion, Ma'ale Adumim, everywhere, but because it, you can, it's not affordable. We found at the last three months in four different areas in East Yerushalayim, from Bet Safafa in the south, Jabel Mukaber Tzur Bacher, and to the north in the area of Bet Hanina, more than 600 dunams belong, belonging to Jewish Americans. No, don't clap your hands. I forgot to say that. We have their names, and uh, we are going to, I will send it to Judy. Okay? We have their names. It's very important because Arab are faking documents, are faking that the Jews sold it to them. It's a lot of property belonged to American Jews that bought it at the last century, at the 20s and 30s of the last century. We have names. Tomorrow I'm meeting Diamond family from Borough Park. They are one of them. A lot. We have names. Da Deutsch, Zachs, Steiner, Wolf, Levine, we, hundreds of American Jews bought land at the 20s, 30s, and 40s of last century, and it's in, today in East Jerusalem. So I will send it to Judy, and this is something that really any one of you that will see a name that you recognize, we need to get to the people, they passed away, again, it's 90 years ago, 80 years ago, but to get to the families and to claim the property back, in some areas, unfortunately, Arabs already built, of course, illegal buildings, so we will need the real heirs in order to get it back to Jewish hands. I will send it to Judy, but please follow up. So here I am calling you, first of all, to wake you up. Wake you up. And to tell you, please, for your own sake, for our own nation's interest, think more about Jerusalem. Pray more for Jerusalem, and do more for Jerusalem, each one in his own way. Thank you.
Thank you, Trudy, and thank you, everyone. Um, after a speech like Arya, it will be hard for me to compete with that. He's a great speaker. But I will try to be more optimistic in my, uh, in my area. Now, I guess you all know that it's not easy area, the, easy of, uh, like the area of how the media portrayed Israel, how the world media. But I will try to explain what the method that we choose to uh, compete or to change this reality. We have another war that's happening, and it's the war about the truth. The real battle today, one of them, is how the world or how we see and know what's happening in Israel. I had just mentioned about what's happening in East Jerusalem or in his house. It's a battle to show it. You, do, you cannot just say, oh, they throw a of cocktail. We need to take a picture of it. You need to show it. You need to tell the people what really going on there. This is a picture that one of my photographers took in uh, Ramallah. You see what, who is standing here in the middle of the event? This is Palestinian throwing rocks. The soldiers are here. This is the medical team. But who these guys are in the middle? This is the press. This is the photographer. They are in the middle of everything. Here, this is another, uh, the same picture from uh, another angle, like wider angle. Here the press, here the protesters, here the soldier, we don't see them, but they are in the middle of everything. And this shocked me. And I said, okay, we have here something. How, what we can do for solving it? So like a good soldier, you know, in Israeli army, everything you separate to three parts. So I understood, okay, we need to find how to win this war. The first thing that we need to do is to find the right target. Then you need the right uh, manpower and ammunition. And one of the most important things, you need the motivation and the spirit to win the war. So that who is the target? What is the most influential uh, news outlet that you know in the world? The most influential one? New York Times. New York Times. BBC. BBC. CNN. No. They are really weak comparing to AP, Reuters and AFP. This is the news agencies, and that's why uh, what I will focus today. They've, what's happening is that you have events, then the news agency is coming, there are reporters. In Israel, all of them, all, most, the majority are Palestinian, and then se they sending their information to media outlets. And then the New York Times using AP and publishing his stories. 85% of the information all around the world controlled by three agencies. 85. AP by yourself getting every day to 15,000 media outlets. Half of the world population. So you see this are a headline? Three Palestinian killed as daily violence rides on. What happened here? Someone remember? The story was three Palestinians that murdered a uh, border police by the name Hadar Cohen. And this is the headline that was on CBS. The Israeli government was so upset with this headline, and they said they will revoke the CBS credential in Israel, and they did a special committee, Tzipi Livni uh, did a committee in the Knesset to condemn the CBS, but they all missed one thing. Who wrote this story? AP. It's not CBS. CBS doesn't have representative in Israel, uh, all the time in Israel. It was Daniela from AP. Another example, you can see four Palestinians killed in Israel after Karelian attacks. Israel killed at least four Palestinians after reported knife attack. Same headline almost. Why the same headlines in, two, in Wall Street Journal and Washington Post? It came from AP again. Another example, Fox News. Three Palestinians and three Israeli killed in violence over holy site. What happened here? You remember the Temple Mount uh, when uh, the murder uh, Israeli police? After that, it was uh, riots. And in the riots, three Palestinians were killed. And Friday night, a terrorist entered to uh, Halamish, Neve uh, settlement and murdered three family members that eat in their house. And this is the headline that was on Fox News. Terrible. 
Oh, Chicago Tribune, the same headline. Same headline also in the Boston Herald. How come all Associated Press? So the, the first thing that if you want to win, you need to understand who are the right targets. And I believe it's the news agencies. This is how it works. Now you need the ammunition and the manpower. So first of all, we have photographers. This is what the power of photographers. This is a picture, a famous picture that on uh, Breaking the Silence website. What we what we seeing here? It looks like a soldier that aiming on a small child in Hebron. Terrible picture. I look carefully in this picture and I found out that I know this soldier. He served with me in the first uh, months of, in my unit. Then he went to another unit. His name is Amir Sigoli. What does Amir does here? He's holding his gun in this position and looking on the kid. But from the angle that the photographer took the picture, it looked like he's aiming on the kid. This is not how you're aiming a gun. This is how you're aiming with a gun. This is another terrible picture. Israeli soldier aiming on really a small, blonde, nice, good-looking girl, my sister, and this is my brother. This is a fake picture. I took it. Why I took this terrible picture? They didn't move. I moved two, two steps to the side, and this is, it's not a terrorist, this is my brother, but he's a, another brother, the dress like a terrorist, and he's aiming on him. But if you're moving two, st two uh, steps to the side, you see something totally different. This is the power of the photographer to tell you, to decide what you will see. Another example, another sister, I have a lot, I can switch between them, it's always good. It looks like my brother is going to eat my sister. Second later, and different angle, and they're taking olive from the tree together. Zoom in, zoom out, the photographer will, tell, will decide what you will see. Another example, you remember the Friday protest, non-violence protest that the Palestinian is doing? Yeah, non-violence. One of the Friday, uh, Israeli, the Israeli military police arrested one of the soldiers because AP released video of him shooting in a protester, and they said he, he shot without any uh, reason. He, were, he had the lucky, and my photographer has been there, and this is my photographer picture. Do you see what he's holding in his hand? This is not a rock. This is also not a rock. They throw grenade on the soldier. So, of course, we released these pictures and the, the soldier was released from jail. But do you think like the AP photographer didn't saw it? This is the photographer. Where is, see where he's standing. And he's sta he throwing grenades. He's standing here. And he, will, he never released this picture. So again, this is the power of the photographer. So first of all, you, want, you need some, someone, you need photographer on the field. Then you need your investigators. For example, you remember the Muhammad al dora case? Yeah. It's really famous, and this is, I have to tell you, until today, Muhammad Dora is one of the greatest is, uh, PR failure in Israel. Why? In 2000, the second day of the second Tifada, a short video clip was um, on the French TV, and you saw there a kid that hiding together with his father behind the concrete, and then you, shoot, you hear shooting, and you see him uh, lying down. All the world blame Israel, but why? What was so different? First of all, it was on camera, but secondly, it was Israel's fault. The Israeli comment, the IDF spokesperson and the, and the prime minister said, right away, we are apologized. In the, more, in the ones that the government apologized, it doesn't matter what was the real story. All the world say, understood that Israel, this is Israel. By the way, this is a picture that I found on the internet. Uh, I like to show it. You see that it's two different pictures that they put together. But what they try to show here, like the Israeli soldiers are shooting the kid. But if you look carefully here, what this kind of, what this part of the gun? Silencer, this is the most common answer, but no, this is called Rome. Rome is part that you're putting on the gun to use it for rubber bullets. It's non-killing it's non uh, uh, weapon. 
They didn't know it. They thought it's a silencer, so they put the two pictures together. But when you understand what you see, you can uh, expose it. But this is, was a big failure of the Israeli government. I will tell you this story, another terrible picture that was on the internet. A soldier that aiming on small child. This is uh, the comment, go to El Israel, Freedom Palestine. Share this photo, let the world see what is really happening in Palestine. What happening in Palestine? I saw this picture on the internet, and I looked carefully, and I saw a few things. First of all, this gun is MK-47. It's, guy that, it's guns that are used by Arab forces, by the Russian, not by the Israeli forces. Secondly, the color of the uniform is not the same like the Israeli soldier. And the glove and everything, I said, something here doesn't right. So I called to the IDF spokesperson. I said, you need to give me the comment. Like, it's starting to be all over. Give me the, let, give me the comment about what the story is. What his, what his answer was? I cannot agree or deny it because I don't see the soldier face. Now imagine if it was any other media outlets. What would be the tomorrow headlines? Of course, I knew what happened there. So I called to the prime minister's office, and they called to the IDF, and then I got the, the comment that it's not possible to be Israeli soldier, and we released this story. Three months later, we found the real picture. This is a picture, a, te a theater in the street in Bahrain. You see the, the actor with the Israeli flag? This is in Bahrain. This is a, a theater show. They're watching. And this whole picture was from there. Again, you need to invest the, to, to check the fact. I will show you a few examples of our latest uh, investigative uh, stories. Exclusive, not only in summer camp, how Hamas exploits children during riots on Gaza. We just released it two weeks ago. A story, one of my photographers spent six months on the border in Gaza and document on video how the Hamas leader is sending the kids to cut the fence to uh, throw grenades against the soldier, and they sitting and cracking seeds when they're sending the, sending the kids. And it's all on video, six months of investigative work. If you will not do it, if you will not be there, no one will know. You can talk about it how many you want. If you cannot show the proof, you're missing here. Another story, uh, two months ago in the last operation in Gaza, uh, the, the Palestinians blame Israel about killing baby and her mother. Of course, the, when, when the story started, I told to my investigator, you need to find me the proof of what really happened there. And he is an expert. He succeeded to get into a Telegram group. It's like WhatsApp. It's closed group just of the Islamic Jihad. And he saw there that they admit it was their missile that was mis, uh, that misshot on the house. Then we sent our photographer from Gaza. We have a Palestinian that working with us to the family. And they hear from the families that the Islamic Jihad gave them compensation because uh, they understood it's their missile. And we went out, we published this story all over the world because we invest in this. Now we need reporters to tell other stories that are happening in Israel. It's not just about the Israeli-Palestinian. Archaeology, how we connected to this land, what we're finding every day about our history. We have a technology. Just one example, we wrote article about passion fruit. Israeli researchers that find, uh, they develop a new kind of passion fruit that's helping against Alzheimer. It went worldwide, our story, and then we got a phone call from the researcher, said, you know what you did to me? I said, no. Because of your article, what, the biggest company in the world for passion fruit drinks decided to invest in my research. And this is how you can also promote Israel in a positive way. You just need to tell the story, to tell the story of Israel, to tell the truth. And then you need the spirit and the motivation. Because all that will not happen if you, not, you don't have the right spirit. We succeed to build a network of more than 300 photographers, volunteers around Israel. And today we are the strongest source of information in Israel. All the Israeli main media outlets using our pictures, our videos, our information on a daily basis. And you can see, and I'm sure that if you will check, how the media changed in the last four years between anti-Judean Samaria to much more balanced today. 
And in a lot of the article, you can see the, in, in small letter, TPS, because we're providing them the truth. This is all a fight. It's a war. And for winning a war, you need to work on that and to work hard. Each one of you can be a warrior, can, be, can do it. Just need to find the right target to invest. And it's, it can be Jerusalem, and it can be uh, the fight on the media. Israel needs a lot of help. And you are the people that can help us and to motivate us to do so. Thank you so much for coming. And for pleasure. We are commemorating 79 years since the passing of Zeb Jabotinsky. And you know the saying that we came here, we gather here to celebrate his life uh, rather than to commemorate his passing uh, became uh, some, some, some sense a cliche. But in this case for me is 100% uh, accurate. Zev Jabotinsky, the physical Zev Jabotinsky, I didn't know him. He passed away here in New York State uh, long before, relatively long before I was born. <laughs> I'm not so young. Um, but for me, Zev Jabotinsky, the spiritual Zev Jabotinsky, and I will say the four letters word, the political Zev Jabotinsky, uh, existed, exists since the day I was born, since the day I have uh, my own, I could form my own mind and, 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 and political perspectives. So for me, the, this specific uh, date of, uh, in which we mark his physical passing is almost uh, just one other day in which we could celebrate the incredible endeavor, the incredible work that Zev Jabotinsky did for the Jewish people. Um, the same, you know, about uh, bringing his bringing him again to reburial from Montefiore um, Cemetery here in Long Island to Har Herzl in Yerushalayim. Um, it was long overdue, as you know. David Ben-Gurion, you know that the, when uh, Jabotinsky passed away in 1940, he wrote in his will that he wants to be buried in Yerushalayim. The British always, obviously would not allow that. He was, as I said, buried here in New York. But he wrote in his will something extraordinary. In 1940, when we were at the, probably the most low point in Jewish history, the darkest days of the Shoah, of the Holocaust, Jabotinsky wrote that he wants to, his body to be brought to Yerushalayim for burial, but only exclusively by order of a Jewish government, of a Jewish state, that I have no doubt that will be established. That's what he stated in his will in 1940. Unfortunately, a person that uh, has extremely high achievements, but in some sense it was also very petty, our first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, prevented that uh, decision from being made. As long as David Ben-Gurion was Prime Minister of Israel, he prevented the government of Israel to make that decision. So, you know, when we speak about polarization, and we speak about uh, how the right hates the left and the left hates the right, well, it's not something so new. Uh, it happened even more virulently and more ugly uh, ways uh, back then. Levi Eshkol, one of the greatest prime ministers of Israel, one of the prime ministers that history makes some injustice with him, maybe because of his lack of charisma, but made some of the most historic decisions uh, any Israeli prime minister ever did. 
finally make that decision and Zev Jabotinsky was reburied in the proper way in Har Herzl. I want to say, I uh, will speak uh, briefly, I want to say the following. We are going, I understand, uh, to sing Shir Beitar, the, the, the anthem of Beitar. The anthem of Beitar is com written by Zev Jabotinsky. That was not only a, an, an ideologue, a, a political leader, was also an intellectual, a writer, a poet, a, a translator of some of the greatest uh, uh, um, masterpieces. It has three parts. The first starts with the word, with the word Betar. Betar has many significances. Betar is an acronym for Brit Yosef Trumpeldor, but Betar in, is first and foremost a place in Eretz Israel. A place that now, uh, after 2,000 years of uh, desolation, 2,000 years after Betar, Betar fall, is being rebuilt and tens of thousands of Jews, tens of thousands of Jewish children live today in Betar. And I think that the first part of Shir Betar is, for me personally, the most important legacy of Rosh Betar of Zev Jabotinsky. Eretz Israel belongs to the Jewish people in, the, in its entirety. And our duty as a new Jewish generation that came, that rose from the ashes and from the dust our first and foremost responsibility is to fill Eretz Israel with Jews under Jewish sovereignty. Yeah, you can clap. Yeah, not for me, for Zev Jabotinsky. In days in which there are those that try to cast doubts on our right on Eretz Israel or on parts of Eretz Israel, Let's remember the words of Zev Jabotinsky, Kula Sheli. It's all of Eretz Israel is ours. <laughs> the second part starts with the word Adar. And Adar is uh, something that uh, unfortunately many in the political world have forgotten. Hadar is a kind of attitude toward others, including political rivals, including political rivals, that is dictated by generosity, by dignity. Uh, these days when in, both in Israel and in America and all over the world, probably because of social media, uh, the political debate has become a debate of, uh, in many cases, insults and blames. Let's remember the Hadar of Zev Jabotinsky. And the third one and the last one is Tagar, challenge. As it, Hadar is important, as it's important to, li to, li to live a dignified life, and as it's important to live a dignified political life, never forget that the challenges that we posed must be overcome. So when we see those, uh, even among our community, that uh, engage in, uh, in uh, activities that are anti-Israeli, we should be polite, but check it to refresh, to be silent when we see attitudes like that, those of, I am sorry to say, fringe Jewish organizations in this country that challenge the very existence of the State of Israel, silence towards them is completely unacceptable. That was the, what Zev Jabotinsky taught us. And I say, to conclude, that uh, when I said that for me Jabotinsky lives, 
because Jabotinsky for me more than a physical person is the 14 or 15 books of all his writings that I have in my library and to which I go to find the response, to find the, an answer each time that I am posed with a problem, a dilemma, a political, ideological um, dilemma. That is Zev Jabotinsky. Not his physical life, but his ideological writings, his, ideolo his ideological legacy. We see that uh, Jabotinsky is alive not only in that respect, but also in the respect, in this respect that seldom has been any ideological leader. That almost 80 years after, after, after his passing is so actual, so actual, so relevant to today's happenings that in some cases I believe that the right, those writings of Jeff Zavotinsky are more actual, are more relevant for today than tomorrow's newspaper. And uh, I will conclude by quoting the last words of Shir Betar. Lamuto lichboshetahar. There are things that if you, there is no thing in life that is worth challenging and achieving more than your very life, then probably your life itself is not worthy enough. We will continue to strive to liberate Eretz Israel, to live in Eretz Israel, to live in Jerusalem, to, to live in new areas of Jerusalem, to make truth relevant throughout the world, and thus, in that way, fulfilling the words of Rosh Betar Zev Jabotinsky. Thank you so much. <laughs> We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.